thanks so much for uh, having me to bath. Bath. I'm not fun. <laughs> so, betray my northern roots there, didn't I? Um, okay, so um, I don't know if you know, but I had a chat with Andrew Neil at the weekend, uh, like you do, and um, he wasn't over impressed. And he said they put out a, a YouTube video and it says, Roger Hallam never mentions China. So, China. <laughs> okay, so that's that over and done with. So unsurprisingly, I'm not going to be talking about China because if you haven't noticed, we live in the United Kingdom and uh, this is where we have to do what we have to do. So I'm going to be talking, in case you don't know, about Insulate Britain. It's a practical civil disobedience project. It's not all going to be, you know, warm words. And um, I'm going to talk for a while, hopefully not too long, but you never know. And, uh, and then I'm going to pass over to two people who are going to talk about um, their commitment to take part in the civil disobedience. So, I am going to talk about the climate crisis. Now, obviously, I don't want to tell you how to suck eggs, so I'm sure you all know it's not good, and it hasn't been good for a long time, and it's getting worse and I had a friend in Portland send me an email yesterday um, where it's been over 100 degrees, three days running, and um, they're all terrified of forest fires. As you presumably I know, I'm a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, and one of the dubious honours of being a co-founder is you get phoned up by the world's top scientists and diplomats, and they want to talk to you and you always have a slight nervous feeling in your stomach because you know what's coming, and they tell you something unbelievably horrendous, and because you've heard it from the horse's mouth, it wipes you out for a day or two, and then you sort of pull yourself together. So I sort of feel if nothing else, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life going around telling the great British public what I'm being told privately, as you might say, by the people who know what's coming down the line. So I'm going to talk about uh, two or three instances. As you may know, there was an article in the conversation about six weeks ago about net zero. Uh, conversation, if you don't know, is this rather prestigious website where academics deem to tell ordinary people what's going on in the world. And it's really a mea culpa. It's a confession, this article. And it's written by three of the top world scientists. I think they've got 80 years of experience between them at the, in, the, in the climate change industry. And in the middle of this confession, they sort of make the central, the central confession, which is, um, I think I'm going to quote it more or less correctly. They said at the 2015 Paris Agreement, quote, they did not know of a single scientist who thought that 1.5 degrees was feasible. They didn't know of a single scientist who thought 1.5 was possible in 2015. And I wrote a Facebook post about it. I said you should stick that quote on your fridge and read it every day for a month. Because it's going to make you mad as hell. Because I'm mad as hell about it. Because as you know, for the last six years, we've all been running around doing this 1.5 thing, haven't we? And it's bollocks, okay? It was bollocks in 2015, and it's even more dead now. And you've got hundreds of thousands of kids around the world doing 1.5, let's do it, and it's not possible. There was not a single scientist. So, I emailed this guy and we had a chat and I said, this is right, you know, didn't want to get my facts wrong. Um, this is 1.5, wasn't possible. And he said, yes. And I said, why was that? 
And he said, well, the world's top scientists, by and large, are white, middle class, living in the global north, tenured professors at elite universities. And then he said, quote, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to rock the boat. All, all 3,000 of them. And he looked white when he was saying it, right? Because he knows what they've done. So what's happening is we're being lied to systematically, right? This isn't a few bad apples. It's not a few euphemistic middle-class comments. It's systematic in the system. And it's leading us nicely to destruction, right? That's what it's all about. Because there's a little quote below it, and they said, I don't know if you know, this is the story. The reason why they did 1.5 was because they didn't want to admit to the small island nations and to the people in the global south that they were going to die. So, dare I say it, it's a little bit like in the Second World War, where you've seen the movies, they put them on the carriages to the next camp, and they go, it's okay, there'll be work there for you. You know, cooperate, don't cause a fuss. And it was a lie, wasn't it? That's what's happening today on a global scale with the climate change industry. It's obscene. So, as you may know, I do research at King's College, or did, to a left. <laughs> and as a good sociologist, you don't look at the science, right? You look at the person communicating the science. You don't take at face value what someone says. You've got to look at the person and the context and the power relationships and the culture, right? We have to use our intelligence to understand the bias. So I'll tell you a little side story on this. Like, do, do people know about the shy Tory effect? Right? If you ask people whether they're going to vote Tory, there's a certain minority of people that don't want to admit to the pollster that they're going to vote Tory, and they go into the polling station and then they vote Tory. Right? This is a big problem for social scientists. So what they do is they take the people who are going to say they're going to vote Tory and then they add 3 or 4% to it. Right? It's not a radical move, it's good social science. So my proposition to you is when you get an expert stand up and tell you about the climate crisis, assume the person's five years out of date, right? Not because you're paranoid, but because you're good social analysts, right? You have that responsibility. So if you want to know what's actually happening in the world, my suggestion is you don't go to someone who's an expert necessarily, you go to someone who's retired, right? Because they haven't got an axe to grind. So I suggest who we go and listen to is Sir David King. Sir David King, as you may know, was the chief scientific advisor to the British Blair and Brown administrations, one of the top three or four establishment scientists in the country. But the most important thing you should understand about Sir David King is that he's retired, right? <coughs> So he doesn't give a damn. So he was in a conference six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, and he said, quote, it's more or less what he said, said, we have to act quickly. I believe in the next three or four years, we will determine the future of humanity. The next three to four years, right? And it's an elite figure, right? So we have to translate what 
the future of humanity means, right? What he means is billions of deaths. I know a leading London lawyer that's talked to him and he won't use the B word, right? Even if he's retired. So that's, that's, the, situ that's the situation. And this is why, right? So this is a quote from him at the conference. We are today at just over 500 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, all the greenhouse gases. We have already passed the tipping point. We are already into a negative carbon budget. There is much discussion about how much carbon budget there is left to burn. And there is none. Okay? There is none. That's what he says. There is none. We have already burned far too much and we have to go into reverse. So when you're listening on the radio to all the world's establishment scientists at COP26 later this year, and they're all talking about the budget, the carbon budget, then you know they're five years out of date, right? And you know in five years' time, there'll be an article in the conversation saying not a single scientist at COP26 thought there was any carbon budget left. Because they all know there's no carbon budget left. So what does that mean? So there's another paper, there's lots of papers, <laughs> papers every week, but let me just choose one of them. So there's a paper called The Future of the Human Niche, and that came out last year, I think. So again, it's by three of the world's top scientists, and it's talking about what's going to happen at two degrees. And the important thing to understand about two degrees is it's, as we all know, it's the average global temperature. But it's not very clever, right? Because, I don't know if you've noticed, but most of humankind, in fact, all of humankind, lives on land, right? So we don't need to include the 70% of the Earth's surface that's on the water. So what we, if we're going to be sensible from a sort of O-level stats point of view, you know, dare I say it, what you, the number you want is the temperature on land, right? That's what we should be discussing, not the sort of convenient low number that the oil lobby has us talking about. So what's the number on land? Well, it turns out at two degrees centigrade of average global increase, right? It's actually seven degrees in inland areas. So, you know, I've got on my computer, Roger Hallam, co-founder of XR, I'd like to talk to you, it's always good. So I get on to Zoom with him, and he's walking his dog, no, no, the dog. <laughs> he's walking his dog in a park in Holland, you know, 60, 70 year old guy, spent 40 years doing this stuff, top of his profession, professor, blah, blah. I said, is this right? Is two degrees seven degrees? And he said, yes. And then he said, we were really shocked. So you've read those articles in The Guardian where you get halfway through and the scientist says, we're really shocked. Again. So he said, we went back and redid the figures. And I think he said, we took two years off it on it, right? So they didn't make this stuff up, you know, down the pub one day. This is using the world's top computers with the top brains to come up with seven degrees. And it took two years. They redid the figures. And then in the paper it says, at the moment, 1% of the world's surface is 30 degrees centigrade, average temperature, right? That's like the Sahara Desert. At two to three degrees, it's going to be 
which is going to go from 1% to 20%, right? So what does that mean? Well, their estimate is at, twin, at 2 degrees average global temperature, which is coming down the line in 10, 15, 20 years, it's go, there's going to be 1,000 million people living in uninhabitable areas like Vancouver, except all the time. So what does that mean? Well, there's going to be a thousand climate refugees. <coughs> what does that mean? They're not all going to get up one day in a nice ordered fashion. There's going to be social breakdown on a massive global scale. And what does that mean? Well, we know from Syria there were five million refugees and all half a million people died in war. So we can make a reasonable assumption that 100 million of those people are going to be dead. Because it doesn't happen in a little vacuum, does it? And we know what that means. In war, two things happen. Men are slaughtered in war and women are raped. So you have a look at the Congo, Massive social collapse, the biggest conflict since World War II. No one really talks about it because it's Africa. Five million people died. And there were two million rapes. And as a good sociologist, we know that that's an underestimate, right? So this is like, this is the reality of what's coming down the line. And in order to get our heads into what we need to do, we have to get into that headspace, that gut feeling of total horror, because otherwise we're not even in the ballpark of doing what we need to do. So I'm going to tell you the really bad news next. Okay, so the really bad news is not that we're facing an absolute catastrophe. Humankind has faced absolute catastrophes over and over again in its history. What is the central aspect of the climate crisis is the tipping points. If we go over the tipping points, and as I'm sure you know, we've passed it in the Arctic, we've passed it in Greenland, we're probably going to pass it in Antarctica, the Amazon is on the edge. We can't come back, right? It gets exponentially worse. So throughout human history, terrible, terrible things have happened, but they don't go exponentially worse, right? You know, we fought for half a century in this country to remove slavery. Slavery was an absolute obscenity. But everyone knew, if we didn't sort it out this year, it'd still be there next year, but it wouldn't be like five times worse, right? You know, when our grandparents went and fought against Hitler, once you destroyed Hitler, that was it, right? That was it. We went back down again. There's no going back down with the climate crisis, right? It's physics. This is the absolute head fuck, dare I say it. This is what we have to understand with a visceral intensity in order to understand what we have to do. Because what we have to do is like nothing else in the history of humankind. We've got two, three, four, five years. That's what Sir David King is saying, right? And what they're saying, by the way, is we've got to slash emissions, but that's too late. We've also got to do massive geoengineering. That's what they're saying, if you want to know. That's the reality. You know, might not like it, right? I mean, I'm an organic farmer, as you may know. It's not my cup of tea, but this is, this is where the world is at. I talked to a Harvard professor type guy, right? And he said, 
said, it's all right, Roger, we can stabilise the situation. We just need to cover 3% of the world's surface with mirrors. That's the whole of the Sahara and the whole of India. They didn't say who's going to clean them. And then he said, oh yeah, and we've got to do it in the next five to ten years, otherwise we're dead. That's what they're talking about in Harvard. So this is the analogy, right? I've only got one visual aid, that's it, right? You're playing football with your kid. The kid kicks the ball, goes down the hill. There's only two outcomes, isn't that? Right? You either catch the ball or you don't. You don't half catch the ball. It either runs away over the cliff or you catch it. It's binary. And so for the first time in the last 10,000 human years of human history, we've got a binary. We're going to, going, to, going to get through this or we're not. So there's no point like running to point one and there's no point running to point two. Running to point two is no better than running to point one, right? If you're going to save the situation, you've got to get to point three. That's just the way it is. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about how we get to point three. We have to be in the ballpark as Extinction Rebellion, as the related networks. Otherwise, we might as well just go and email, right? It's a binary. So before I go into what this project is about, I want to re just go through, through two or three foundational points. So the first point, as I've said, there's no time. That's not rhetoric, right? It's not XR media messaging going, well, how can we mobilise people? Let's say there's no time. <laughs> there's no time, okay? It's like you go to the doctor, you've got six months to have chemotherapy and that's it. Bang. Right? It's physics. It's biology. The other thing is, is because we've got no time, we don't have the luxury of pure critique, right? You know what pure critique is? It's like that little voice in your head that goes, well, Roger's idea, you know, it's quite good, but there's this wrong with it, and there's that wrong, wrong with it, so I'm just going to stay on social media and complain, right? There's lots of people like that. We, we don't have the option of complaining for three years while we come up with something else, right? What we have to look at in the next six months is what puts us in the ballpark and number three. So the question is not do you participate in this project. The question is do you participate in this project or do what, right? What else are you going to do given we've got no time, right? You're standing in front of the house. Your kids are in the window. They're shouting. They're going to die from the fire. That's the analogy, right? That's the Greta analogy. You're either going to go in the front door or you're going to meander around the edge and wonder about it. You don't. You're going in the front door, right? You might not save your kids, but you know that's what you've got to do. You don't even think about it. That's the situation we're in. So that bring, brings me on to the related point, which is, with all due respect, right? This is not about you. This is not about traditional consumer activism. We're not here this evening to go, well, you know, I might like to do that or I might like to do this. We're not talking about apples and oranges in the supermarket, right? This is not old-fashioned consumer environmentalism. This is a mad dash to save everything. So it's not about you as individuals. 
It's not about your choices. It's about one thing, and that one thing is doing what is necessary as a community. So this campaign didn't come out of anywhere, right? I don't go around the country, you know, with a little bit of paper going, that sounds pretty good. Like, this has been fought out by some of the best campaign designers in the Extinction Rebellion culture. And as such, it's based upon historical research. Because one of the best ways to understand how to change society in the least possible time is to look at how it's been done over and over and over again in history. And it's specifically based upon the Freedom Riders episode in 1961 in the civil rights movement in America. And you, some of you may know the story, but in 1961, the civil rights movement was in a mess. Right? It was in a mess. They had the Montgomery bus boycott, Everything was fantastic, a little bit like April 2019. It was all great, and then it all went flat, and everyone started arguing about money and structures and decisions and leaders. You know, sounds familiar, doesn't it? XR, right? It happens over and over again. So what did they do? The first thing they did, they didn't all get together and do a big consultation exercise, right? Some people decided to do what was necessary in order to create change and do what was needed. And there was only 24 people that started it off. And they got in buses, they sat black and white people on the bus, and they drove down, not to Virginia, right, to the heart of darkness, as it were, in Alabama, and they were beaten up, and their bus was set on fire, and they went to prison. And three days later, another 24 people stepped forward, and then another 24. And by the end of the summer, there was 430 people in prison. And then they won. That's how you change history. So you need to understand why and how. Right? This is not Friends of the Earth. It's the Freedom Riders. Okay? This is Friends of the Earth. No disrespect, I used to be in Friends of the Earth. Right? This is the Freedom Riders. In other words, we have to design something that's in the ballpark. They didn't know they were going to win, but they knew they were in the ballpark. So when you're going to design something that's going to give us a chance, there's always several different elements, OK? If you just do one thing, nothing happens. If you do two or three, maybe. But only if you're doing four or five things do you actually create this nonlinear reaction. And this is the good news, right? You know how it is, you go and do something in Bath and you get, you know, page five of the local paper, right? And it's like you're trundling along, trundling along, and then suddenly you create, you get to a tipping point, and suddenly you're in the world, world's press. And that's what happened in April 2019, right? But what we need to understand about April 2019 is lots of people hated the idea, right? Lots of people didn't like me. You know, I said, right, let's go and do this, this, and this with a bunch of other people. And people go, no, 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 we mustn't do that because there's going to be Brexit. And no one's going to be interested in climate change. But we did it anyway because we were out of time. We had to take that risk. We had to take the risk that no one would be interested in us because they're all going to be talking about Brexit. Can you remember? 2019, it was like endless Brexit. So we were lucky. But we had a whole bunch of elements, right? We went to London. 10,000 people went. We went on five sites. We stayed for 10 days, 1,200 arrests. Nothing happened until the Thursday. And then we were on the front page of the Times, and four or five days later, we were talking to Jeremy Corbyn, and we were in the world's news. Right? Nothing happens, and then everything happens. 
And it was intensely stressful, the design. Because everything, everything within us wanted to say, let's just go to Marble Arch, right? It's easy. We could get onto Marble Arch. Well, if you just got onto Marble Arch, it would be Glastonbury in London, right? It'd be on tape, page five of The Guardian. It'd be nice, pat on the head, off you go. What we knew is we had to go to five sites, right, to make history. And we were terrified because we thought, we're not going to get on five sites. You know, the police aren't going to allow us. But we did it anyway because we had to take that risk to get to point three. You understand? You have to take that risk. Otherwise, you're not even where you, we need to be. Okay, so I'm going to run through this project, okay? There's four different elements to it. The project is to make a demand of the British government in the run-up towards COP to insulate all the social housing in Britain. There'll be a formal demand going in at the beginning of August. It's a Gandhi-esque operation in the sense that it's an ultimatum, right? If the government doesn't substantially respond by the middle of September, then civil disobedience will begin. So I'm going to go through different elements, okay? And I'll fill you in as I go along. So if you're going to design something, one of the key things, this is really boring but really important, is if you're going to succeed, it often depends upon what's called the structural weakness of the opposition, right? There's you and how strong we are, and then there's the bad guys, right? So what happened in 1961 I don't know if you know, but it was in the middle of the Cold War and President Kennedy was about to go to Vienna to talk to Khrushchev and it was the middle of all that Cold War stuff and he was presenting himself as the leader of the free world and then there were black people getting beaten up for wanting to sit on a coach with white people. It didn't look very good, right? It didn't look very good when dozens of people were going to prison. In fact, he was apoplectic with rage because his whole... His whole PR process, his whole framing was just destroyed. So he was shouting down the phone, get it sorted out, get to a resolution, because he was vulnerable structurally. So this is what's happening in the UK over the next six months. There's a similar moment of opportunity because for the first time in 20 years, the eyes of the world are on this country on climate because of COP. So we have a fantastic opportunity and responsibility to do whatever is necessary to show the world how to make a change work, right? So if there's people going to prison, blah, blah, right? A big hoo-ha going on while Boris Johnson's doing his media routine, right? You know, I'm Mr. Green, I promise to do this, I've got this plan, you know, we've heard it a million times. It's not going to look good if there's dozens of people going to prison to get him to insulate a few houses. You get it? Okay, so that's Johnson. What else? The heart of this campaign and the heart of all <laughs> rapid political change in history combines disruption and sacrifice. And we're never going to be in this ballpark unless we attract the attention of the nation. That's just like, if we don't do that, we might as well go home, okay? We've got to design something that ha creates 10 million conversations. It doesn't matter what those conversations are particularly, right? We know what they're going to be. Those guys are twats, but they've sort of got a point, right? That's the conversations we want. That's the conversations in 2019, right? People didn't like us, but they respected us because they sort of knew we were right. And we changed the conversation. 
This time round, we, do, we don't want to change the conversation. We won the conversation in 2019. Everyone knows climate change is terrible, unless you're, you know, right on the edge. We won that. 67% of the British population agreed there was a climate emergency. What we have to do now is to force the government to act. And we do that by creating disruption. And we haven't got 3,000 people to get arrested, which is the usual model. We've got 300 people, potentially. What can 300 people do? Right? So remember, the Freedom Riders had 24 people, and they changed history in the most powerful nation on the earth through prophetic, dramatic, direct action. That's what we need to do. What we're going to do is, if there's no response from the Johnson government, is to go onto the motorways in the southeast of England when the, station, when the traffic is stationary, it's going to be safe, and block the motorway in a systematic, non-violent, peaceful, organised way. Bang. Right? That's the proposition. And they'll arrest you, and then you get released, and you go back. Right? In the, in the Freedom Riders, once they got beaten up, they didn't go, I'm off back. They came out of hospital and got on the bus again. That's how you change history. You do what's necessary. So you go back onto the road, right? When the traffic's stationary, there's going to be a whole bunch of points that are being researched. And then they'll arrest you again. And maybe again. And then, assuming Pretty Patel's listening to this, she's going to put you in prison, right? <coughs> So for the first time in British history, in modern British history, there's going to be dozens of people go to prison. There's about 80 people signed up to this project already. We're doing 50 meetings like this around the country. It's not just me, there's a whole bunch of people doing it. I mean, looking to get 300, but we're going with 120. In other words, if there's 300 people in prison, it'll be the biggest political, radical political transgression since whenever, right? 1819, Peter Lou, whatever. It's going to be world news. The whole world's going to be looking at Johnson and saying, what, you're Mr. Green and you've got 200 people in prison because they want you to insulate some houses. It's not going to look good, right? You see how it's building up, okay? So the other thing is the demand, right? If, if, you're going to, if you're going to design an effective strategy, you can't just do the same old routine, right? You've got to think. It's all about thinking. It's not easy. If it was easy, we'd have done it by now, right? What we, what we need to think about is, what is it that's going to persuade the Prime Minister to insulate the social housing in Britain. That's the project, right? The project isn't to pat ourselves on the back. The project isn't to get brownie points with the British public. The project isn't to come back to Bath and go, wow, that was great, you really worked hard. The project is to get to point three. Okay, so let's define down what that is. So why are we choosing insulation, right? Lots of people in XR have said, insulation, you know, it's not really my thing. It's not about you. It's about winning, right? I mean, I'm an organic farmer. I want subsidies for organic farmers. That's not going to turn on a white van driver in Plymouth. What we have to focus on, like all smart political actors, is who, what, what demographic is going to influence Johnson, right? We know. Right? It's the red wall voters. What do they want? They're concerned about bread and butter issues, right? They're not concerned, with all due respect, with dolphins and whales. What they want to know is jobs, income, right? What, what, what's the thing about insulation? 
insulation is the biggest no-brainer reform that a Western government can do. Why? Because per unit of investment, it gives the highest return in reductions in carbon emissions. That's the project, right? Reduction in carbon emissions. There's a whole, there's a list of them. The experts have told us, you know, there's about 40 things you can do. Top of the list is insulation, because you make the money back. Plus, it creates thousands of jobs for those people that vote for Johnson. And it saves thousands of lives, brings millions of people out of fuel poverty. It's a social justice issue for our country. So what those voters are concerned about is their grannies who are in their cold houses and they're going to get insulated. So no one's saying like this is absolutely perfect, right? Remember, when you're thinking about this, the question isn't, you know, is insulation some perfect campaign? It's like, what else is there? So the fourth element is the dilemma demand, right? And again, like, this is counterintuitive because all of us want to go down, you know, to London and we want to be going, the end of climate change, yes, <coughs> right? That's not how you change history. What this campaign is based upon is the Martin Luther King strategy, which is the sequential demand of specific legislative changes, right? You start with one, you win it, you go on to the next one, you win it, and you go on to the next one, you win it. And through that process, of course, you create the national conversation that creates the new culture. So what we want to do is have a demand which is achievable, which is winnable. When the Freedom Riders went down to the Deep South, right, no one was pretending that allowing black and white people to sit on a bus was going to deal with the whole structural racism of the South, right? Why did they do that? Because they could win it. And through winning it, you galvanize the movement, like we did in 2019 when we changed the conversation, right? 200,000 people signed up. No one's signing up now because nothing's happening, because we're not credible. What we need is a win. And the really exciting thing about this is a win doesn't just inspire people in the UK, it inspires people around the world. So this is the reverse non-linearity, right? Because I spend most of my time helping people in Australia, and the US and Canada, Poland, right, do mobilization. And the fact of the matter is, and I'm not trying to be overly patriotic, okay, this is the only country that has the substantial civil disobedience movement necessary to create a win. It's on us, guys, this year. So that's like exciting and terrifying, isn't it? But it's the truth. So, a final thing I want to say before I sum up is <coughs> don't let anyone persuade you that you're the bad guys, right? You're not doing something that's illegal here. You're enacting the law of this country. Sir David King has said there's no carbon budget. The British government is legally obliged through an act of parliament to stay below two degrees. It is absolutely obligated to do whatever is necessary to slash carbon emissions in 2021, right? Again, with the Freedom Riders, the Supreme Court had already desegregated the buses, okay? They went down to the Deep South to enforce the law against the illegality of state governments. We're going on the motorways to say we're here to enforce British law because the British government is not above the law, right? That's what, that's what we do in this country. The government is not supreme. It's subject to the law. And the law is two degrees. We're not going over it. And it's a human rights issue. We have the right 
to engage in disruption. And we have the right to engage in disruption because in English common law, there's right of necessity. Right of necessity is not some arbitrary, you know, historical curiosity, right? It's a vital part of the British legal culture. It was established in the English Civil War when they knocked down houses in the Great Fire of London and they, they were allowed to do it because that stopped the fire, right? We're disrupting the country to stop the destruction of the country, full stop. That's the frame. Like three years ago, I was in a court, I'd spent, as you probably know, caused 10,000 pounds of damage to King's College's walls. No one was disputing it. The jury went out for 40 minutes, unanimously not guilty. Why? Because I had a legal right to create damage and disruption in order to prevent greater harm, okay? The Shell 6, 70,000 pounds worth of damage to the Shell headquarters. Did you see that? Three days, that jury were in tears. Right, I've just given you half an hour of what the climate emergency is. Can you imagine sitting for three days listening to what's coming down the line with the judge interrupting, going, can't talk about that. But you do, right? They came up and they shook the hands of those people after that three-day trial. Why? Because in this country, we have the right of necessity, right? It's common sense. So don't get into that frame, you know, that your neighbours or your mum or, you know, your in-laws are going to go, you know, whatever. Because you're British citizens and you have rights and you have obligations. And at no time in our history have we had a greater right to disrupt than in 2021 because of this. Okay. I'll sum up. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but the whole of Bath, Bath, is in, isn't in this room, okay? You haven't noticed that? The whole of Bath isn't in this room. The whole of XR Bath is not in this room. The people that are in this room are you. The only people who are going to make history are you. The only people who are going to get to here are you. I'm not being rhetorical, it's a fact. We've got 50 meetings. We have to get to 300 people. This is not theoretical, okay? I talked to a Guardian journalist. It does 20 people in prison, right? I mean, 20 people have been to prison already. No one's bothered. What the Guardian journalist said is there's 50 people in prison, you'll be on the front page of the Guardian. A Times journalist said, if there's 100 people, you'll be on the front page, right? If there's 200 people in prison, we're in world history, right? It's a hockey curve. It depends on you. And the fact of the matter is, some of you are going to have to make sacrifices. Some of you is going to be fine, right? Some of you are going to have to talk to your partners. Some of you might have to risk your jobs. Some of you might even lose your home, like I did at King's College in 2019. But this, this is how we're going to save this country and our children. There's no other option. I wish there was, because I hate saying this to you. In all honesty, it's the part of the talk that I hate the most. 
because I know it's really painful. But believe me, right? I'm an expert. I'm not God, but I study this. If there was another way, I'd go, fantastic, you know? There's no other way. But the good news is, it's peanuts, right? Compared with what people went through to enable us to sit in this room today in relative comfort and liberty. And we have that responsibility, don't we? This is our time. It's our time. It's not going to come again. We have that responsibility to our grandparents and we have that responsibility to our kids and our grandchildren. No one else is going to do this. We've got three to four years. It's the most bizarre, bizarre situation. But the good news is, is we're a community. It's not about you. It's about joining together as Bath XR, as a community. Some people will do it. Some people will be in support. It's not about your individual decision. And what I can say is that it's a beautiful thing, okay? It's a beautiful thing to come together in community. It's going to be potentially the most beautiful thing you do in your life. Because there's nothing, there's nothing more beautiful than stepping up to do what's right. Thanks.